Friends, it's my privilege now to request Professor Arun Chokalingam, our technical program chairman, to introduce our next speaker, Professor Srinath Reddy. Professor Chokalingam. Good morning. Manakam. Uh, I welcome all of you to the second day of our healthcare summit. It is a pleasure to introduce my good friend and a long time associate, Dr. Srinath Reddy. People have got passions for something. Everybody has got passions. Whereas Srinath has got a passion for India. He studied and graduated his higher degrees at McMaster University in Canada. He had a choice to live in Canada, but his love for India was even higher. So he went back to India. And then he is one single voice for a long time that I know who has been pushing and advocating for public health in India. At the, at the very nascent time, when there was no public strength in India, Dr. Reddy has motivated the government and the researchers and the people around to ensure that public health gets its importance. So the result is the Public Health Foundation was formed and Dr. Srinath Reddy was appointed as the founding president. Srinath, he is very well known internationally for his solidarity for science. And he is very candid and uh, he has several accolades. I can talk about it and, and it will take, take time. But in the interest of time, let me just simply say he is a phenomenal human being. Srinath, it is a pleasure to invite you to give the keynote then. Thank you very much, uh, Arun. Uh, greetings of the day to anybody who is in whichever time zone they are participating from in this Indo-Canada event. Let me speak a little bit about what has happened in terms of COVID-19 in India. I believe much would have been covered already in the sessions that have preceded mine. But I will try and give an overarching public health perspective. Indeed, the Indian experience with the first wave in 2020 was a relatively light touch affair. We did not suffer much damage. And despite dire predictions of doom, to a relatively weak health system, which many international commentators forecast. India managed without a very heavy loss of life and even the case counts when adjusted for India's population size were on the lower side. The reasons why India had these advantages were that we initiated early action but we also had some additional advantages of a younger age, as well as a larger proportion of the rural population as socio-demographic advantages on our side. Even though the first case landed in India in the form of an infected Indian student from Wuhan on the 30th of January, the cases were rather few by March by the time our lockdown was imposed. And after a long and in extended national lockdown. Even the release was in graduated phases. And towards much of 2020, there were considerable restrictions on travel. There was also a, some amount of both enforced and adopted discipline in terms of large crowds not gathering. There were still several places where malls and large shopping areas and cinema halls either were closed or were permitted only with very small numbers. And 
we saw that masks were mandated and at least partially followed. So both in terms of public health discipline being observed by people as well as through enforcement of regulations by governments across the country, we did see a fair amount of response in terms of reduced transmission or at least controlled transmission even after the lockdown. But the younger age of the population also helped in reducing the morbidity and mortality. And given the fact that only 6% of India's population is above 65 years of age, compared, for example, to 23% in Italy, 20% in France, and 16% in the USA, we did not have as much of morbidity as we would have seen if we had an older population. Also, two thirds of India is rural, where the dynamics of transmission are going to be different from that of urban concentrations. For the simple reason that crowd density is much less, people live in better ventilated houses rather than in large apartment complexes. They do not commute long distances either within the village or between the villages. And many of them at this point of India's health transition have lower rates of diabetes, hypertension and cardiovascular disease than in urban areas. Therefore, both in terms of transmission as well as relative protection from the severe manifestations of COVID disease, rural India was somewhat spared, but that was not uniformly so. States like Kerala or Tamil Nadu or Maharashtra, which had much better urban rural connectivity and a lot more movement did see higher rates in rural areas there too. But most of the other states in India, where, which had somewhat sequestered rural populations, did not feel the damage from the pandemic in the, in the first phase. But in the second wave, most of these protective factors did not help because we now had a virus which had a fully open population, which was highly exposed because unfortunately there was a perception propagated even by some sections of the scientific and public health communities that India was not going to experience a second wave because they had a very large number of susceptibles already exposed and possibly having acquired herd immunity at the population level. Several models were also proposed by mathematical modelers suggesting that the pandemic had actually ended in India and forecasts were made in February that we would not have a second wave. While there were voices to the contrary, including mine, which cautioned against that kind of an assumption and exposing the fallacy of the herd immunity concept as a population level attribute, uh, which was now widely manifest in India and suggesting that we ought to retain our caution at least till midsummer, if not longer. Unfortunately, the impression that we would not experience a second wave was well received by policymakers across the country and also by the industry, which wanted to put the economy back on the fast track after having suffered a slump during the pandemic and even slightly earlier. People too wanted to get back to normal lives, travel and meet families. And therefore the feeling that we had actually escaped from the grip of the pandemic in a permanent manner was unfortunately a false impression that gained ground. And, and then super spreader events took place by way of uh, elections to local bodies as well as state assemblies. We had large religious gatherings, not only the Kumbh Mela, but a number of regional uh, religious festivals as well. People traveled both domestically as well as internationally. And as with people mingling and moving, the virus had a free passage. But we now had an additional danger because by now the mutants had already either entered or emerged in India. We knew even by early January, when we had unfortunately declared victory rather prematurely, that the Kent variant or the British variant now called the B1117 had already been detected in India and was spreading in some parts. And with some early spikes were already seen. And of course, then other mutants also uh, emerged from different parts of the country, 
B1617 from Maharashtra and B1618 from uh, Bengal. So given the fact that now the original virus as well as the, new, uh, the variants now had a super highway to travel and challenge, there was a much greater speed and spread of the pandemic in India. And we saw that coming up in a ferocious second wave, which came up in March and then really reached very high dimensions of damage by April uh, this year. But then the resistance began. And I think we started seeing how, again, the country had to mount a defense against this by lockdowns or near lockdowns and also uh, multiple restrictions, even if there was not a full lockdown and also ensuring that as far as possible, uh, there was a higher level of testing. And even though the tracing would not have been possible at these levels of spread, at least the tracing of variants was being attempted and uh, genomic analysis was also being ramped up. But we also recognized that our health system was no longer as well prepared as it was in the later stages of 2020, because this false assumption that we had actually overcome the challenge meant that even some of the temporary hospitals that were set up were now dismantled by February. And also the oxygen supplies, which were previously preferentially allocated for medical use were now being again diverted to predominantly industrial use and alternate arrangements were not made. And some of these challenges really came to the fore by April when there was a great deal of shortage of hospital beds in bigger cities. And of course, the challenge of even oxygen, which has been highlighted in the international media. And also we recognize that the vaccine plan itself was predicated on the assumption that we might not have such a large second wave, or at least if, even if we had, it would not surge to these heights. And therefore, a more leisurely calendar of vaccination was planned with initially the people above 60 and those under 60, but over 45 with comorbidities being targeted apart from the essential workers, health workers and other essential worker categories. So both the criteria of essentiality and vulnerability were applied and judiciously so. But then it was also decided that everybody above 45 would also be vaccinated without having to necessarily produce medical documentation of comorbidities because in a health system that did not always detect people with diabetes and hypertension, many would have laid undetected and not knowing their status. So wisely it was decided that everybody above 45 would be vaccinated and those under 45 with documented comorbidities would also be vaccinated. But later on, because it was observed that a number of children were getting affected, of course, it was expected so, to so be so because uh, uh, when children were sheltered in the first wave, now they were much more exposed and also the overall numbers went up. The concern became a little more severe and it was decided that everybody above the age of 18 years would be vaccinated. But given the fact that we did not really ramp up our vaccine production or even procurement internationally, the vaccine plan became a little slow and we are still gathering forces. But hopefully after June, we should now see higher levels of production in the country and also possibly a greater access to some of the international stocks which might be diverted uh, in our direction. So the problem was that our health system, unfortunately, slipped into a lower gear, anticipating a non-emergency scenario and then had to move into a higher gear very rapidly when challenged with a huge surge. And there were naturally a few hiccups in some parts of the country, but at the moment, a resistance is being mounted all across the country, both through lockdowns or near lockdowns, as well as greater production of oxygen, better mobility of the oxygen transport, and ensuring that uh, things are coming down. However, there is a challenge. While the urban areas, which initially began the second wave and uh, highlighted the challenges that we had are now beginning to settle down. And we are likely to see as right now, uh, a stabilization and possibly a decline in the rates overall of the country driven by these developments in urban areas and some of the large uh, 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 states which began the pandemic earlier like Maharashtra and Kerala. Nevertheless, 
we are now seeing the big challenge emerging in rural areas. Uh, and uh, we are finding that many of the rural areas and small towns which were previously protected are now seeing uh, high rates of exposure because of a high rate of uh, urban, rural, rural, urban commuting and the virus has gone along with the local body elections and the religious festivals from one place to another. And this has now caused a huge challenge in terms of the high rural rates. But some states are functioning fairly well, even there. And the, these are the states with better functioning health systems. These are and also better systems of governance, at least administrative governance. Uh, though political governance might sometimes be slipping in some of these states, nevertheless, the administrative governance was generally stable. And I'm talking of the states like uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and uh, other southern states, and particularly uh, creditable has been Odisha, which has really maintained not only political stability, but also good governance, and has ensured much greater public participation and at the panchayat level, along with Kerala and Tamil Nadu, and ensured that everybody gets free testing and free treatment, irrespective of whether it's a public hospital or a private hospital, the state is covering the cost. And uh, some of the states which had really increased their health budgets over the last 10 years are doing much better in terms of having systems on the ready in terms of the response. And while the challenge is very severe, their ability to cope with it is also reasonable as compared to some of the states in central and northern India, which are now facing the severe challenge of rising rural rates and also the small towns. And the Northeast, which has been sheltered somewhat, is also now beginning to face the challenge. Maharashtra is exemplified despite having the highest number of cases and also being challenged very severely, both in the first wave and the second wave, that it can actually demonstrate models of good governance, which are based on decentralized response. Very good ward level municipal response in the city of Mumbai has exemplified how well it can be controlled. And even Dharavi, which was expected to be a disaster zone, escaped very lightly with very little damage because of the amount of decentralized response that was provided at the ward level uh, in the large city of Mumbai and other cities to have followed that example. So we have seen several good models also emerging during this period, which will stand us in good stead when we are challenged in the future. But what we need to do now is to reduce the transmission because our vaccination rates will not really pick up so much as to have mass universal vaccination by the end of the year, though that is the expectation, but that may not be easy to do. But we need to do everything possible to contain the transmission because whether it is the original wild virus or the variants, they can only enter through three portals in the human body, the nose, the mouth, and the eyes. And the better we can actually protect people and then keep them masked outside of the house, keep them in better ventilated places, and ensure that super spreader events do not occur, then we will still have the ability to control the transmission as has been the international experience and even the experience now over the past six weeks. But we also need to protect the sick by ensuring that we provide better home care management and assure emergency transport systems function well if any of them need transport to the hospital and we need to ensure that the hospitals too are geared up and do not feel have the shortages of uh, either equipment or oxygen or the healthcare personnel. And we need to ramp up our vaccination as fast as possible through both accelerated production of those which are being domestically produced and also increased procurement from abroad as possible. And this is being done at the moment uh, in real earnest, but we recognize that there are huge challenges of vaccine availability globally and not just for India. But I would like to conclude by saying that I don't think we should actually focus only on what is the immediate challenge because then we would not learn for the future. I think the pandemic has been a great teacher too, telling us what we must do and what we must not do. And one of the big lessons it has brought is that you must have health systems on the ready functioning in an efficient and equitable manner. If you do not have an efficient and equitable health system functioning in the steady state, in a non-pandemic state, 
without a public health emergency, you will not be able to build a swift and strong surge response when challenged with a public health emergency. Then you'll have to scamper with ad hoc arrangements and you will always fall short, however much you try with uh, as much uh, willpower as possible. So that is the big lesson that you must have stronger health systems. Unfortunately, we have neglected health systems in many parts of the country with very low levels of public financing, low levels of health manpower, uh, health workforce rather, and also in not ensuring that our primary healthcare system has been well developed, in, particularly in urban areas. Paradoxically, primary healthcare system was not even a design feature in most places. And even the primary healthcare system in the rural areas, which was the design feature, was not allocated enough resources to function well. We have huge shortages of health workforce across all categories. And even those who have graduated are not fully available, either because they're retired or uh, for other reasons, they're not pursuing the uh, profession that they were worked in. And therefore we need to fill in all of these gaps as fast as possible. We need to equip our primary healthcare centers and the district hospitals much better and not just focus only on high-end tertiary care hospitals. All our <clears throat> claims of having uh, big hospitals for me medical tourism will fall flat if we neglect our primary care and secondary care and end up with uh, huge medical challenges. We must ensure that all components of our health system are adequately uh, financed and promoted. Primary care becomes absolutely essential for a variety of reasons right from early detection of cases, uh, for testing, for isolation, for home care, uh, for counseling, for contact tracing. Uh, all of these are essential, and even for vaccination, overcoming vaccine resistance. All of these are contingent upon primary health care. We also recognize that comorbidities are very important. Non-communicable diseases like uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, as well as hypertension. All of these are absolutely important elements that are contributing to the high levels of morbidity and mortality in COVID everywhere in the world and even in India. Unless we start detecting these conditions apart from preventing them, we, we must detect them early and manage them efficiently so that people do not fall victim uh, to the comorbidity aggravated uh, COVID disease. And it's not just COVID. Any respiratory virus claims its victims through comorbidities, whether it's influenza virus or SARS-1 or MERS, we have seen that. Yet, if we do not pay attention to non-communicable diseases in a comprehensive healthcare approach in primary healthcare, then we would have lost the battle before it begins. So that is where I believe we need to pay a lot more attention to primary healthcare. Secondary healthcare with oxygen equipped district hospitals and other hospitals would become very important. Even tertiary care becomes important. And these are important elements. Emergency transport systems are important. For, uh, innovations like telemedicine have come in. They will have to get promoted. They'll have to become part of the future health systems. Digitally enabled primary healthcare providers, as well as telemedicine, will become a very important partnership of the future. We also recognize that finally, because of the prolonged pandemic and the damage it is causing to the economy, damage it's causing to the education system, I believe now there is a greater recognition among our policymakers that we must now invest more in health and ensure that our health systems do not fail when the challenge comes. The finance, 15th Finance Commission uh, last year, after the first wave, uh, asked for greater allocation uh, of, of money to health, especially to primary health care emphasizing that urban primary healthcare was a neglected area and that needed to be attended to. They asked that the local bodies in the villages, the panchayats, as well as the municipal uh, local bodies in the urban areas must be given the funds directly for improving primary healthcare. They also asked for more critical care facilities to be set up, better surveillance systems to be established. I hope all of those recommendations will come to pass mm -hmm. even when the pandemic threat has passed and we should be able to address all of that. Finally, I would like to say, if there is one lesson that the whole world has learned, and particularly India must listen to, is that if we neglect our health systems, if we neglect our public health, economy will keep slipping 
on the banana peels of public health failure. We should avoid that. Thank you very much. Srinath, that, that is a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your candid presentation and giving a recipe how India can come back from this COVID pandemic. I think that's great. Uh, normally, we don't ask questions for the keynote speakers, but I have to make one exception. And very rarely we get a person like you to be available. There is one question that came from uh, the floor, and they want to have uh, your your perspective. Uh, could could somebody mute it? There is a reflection of voice. Uh, why we are seeing individuals who have been vaccinated in India twice reporting infection uh, on a personal note, this person's uh, relative, around say 75 years of age, had a significant comorbidity and post bypass, including diabetes and COPD. So he has been affected, but slowly recovering. But this is not the only case. There are several people who are reporting similar things. What is your perspective, Srina? Well, let's understand the science behind reinfection of, and how immunity is produced by a vaccine and how it has been assessed in a clinical trial. We know that these are systemic vaccines so far available, which produce systemic immunity once the virus has entered the body. It doesn't prevent the virus from entering the body. It prevents severe disease and death. It doesn't prevent infection per se, in general. But we know that even in the clinical trials, which were used to assess these vaccines, the endpoint that was looked at was preventing COVID-19, not preventing the infection with the virus which means preventing the disease caused by the virus. And that was the yardstick by which the efficacy was measured. And the efficacy has varied across different vaccines. The two vaccines that are used in India currently, though the Russian vaccine has just come in, if you look at the Covishield vaccine, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine, in the doses that it was given previously in the AstraZeneca international trial of two full doses, four weeks apart, the efficacy was 62%. It was only in a modified version where the second dose was accidentally given three months later that the efficacy rose to mid 76% or 79%. But still that means anywhere between 30% can still get 30 or even 35% can still get severe COVID. That's what the trials show. And that's true of other vaccines too. But we know that the mRNA vaccines have much higher efficacy rates, about 94, 95%. That means only four to 5% risk of getting infected and then developing severe COVID disease. And we have seen reinfections happen even in North America, but much less because of the higher efficacy rates. But we also know that reinfections will come down when the infections themselves will come down because lower transmission will inevitably result when a large number of people are vaccinated because people who develop mild infections are not going to discharge many virus particles and not for long anyway. That is why you see in Israel, you see in parts of United States and the United Kingdom, Transmission rates have come down, but that is because their vaccination rates in the population have been very much higher than in India, and the vaccines they've used have higher, higher efficacy rates. But even they will not completely guarantee that a person will not get infected. For that, we may have to wait for mucosal vaccines, which produce IgA antibodies, which wash out from the mucosa any virus that is attempting to stay, enter and stay. We do not yet have mucosal vaccines available. They're still under development and early stages of clinical trials, possibly 
few months later, we might get there. But this is the reason why we are seeing reinfections in India. And also remember, if there is a 75-year-old person with comorbidities, as you have stated in the example given, that person's immune response to a vaccine also will be low. Every vaccine doesn't produce the same amount of immune response in everybody. It depends upon the age, the nutritional status, and a person at 75 years of age is unlikely to produce the same immune response as an 18 year old person or a 20 year old person. And therefore, one would expect their susceptibility to reinfection also will be higher. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Srinas. On behalf of the committee, I express a sincere gratitude to you. Thank you. Namaste. Anakam. One over to Dr. Lakshmana. Greetings, uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy. It's a pleasure and privilege to be inviting you for the conference. I want to thank you particularly for helping us, partnering with Fiki. Remember meeting you on March 10th in your office in Apollo Hospital in Hyderabad last year, 2020. You were the president of FIKI and you were spontaneously agreed to help us. And for the last year, we have had excellent cooperation and help from FIKI. I want to thank you for making that happen. The whole committee thanks you for your, for your help. Dr. Sangeeta Reddy is the Joint Managing Director of Apollo Hospitals, a leading healthcare service provider in India with more than 75 hospitals around the world. They have been part of our healthcare summits right from the beginning. Mr. Rahul Reddy participated in the first one. Dr. Peter Reddy participated in the second summit in New Delhi. Here we have the privilege of having Dr. Sangeeta Reddy helping us with the conference in the organization and also kindly accepting to share her thoughts with us. Dr. Sangeeta Reddy. So thank you, Dr. Lakshman, and uh, let me begin by congratulating all of you for continuing to hold your conference despite the tremendous disruption across the world. Um, and namaste and good morning to all of you. Uh, Dr. Srinath Reddy is a very difficult act to follow, and I have been asked to speak about the Apollo Hospital's COVID response. So on behalf of Apollo, let me thank you for this opportunity to share some of our thoughts and, and really be with you today. I believe that any uh, scenario, any situation uh, is really premediated by the ground reality, the extent of the problem and the capability, et cetera, of the response and is also kind of a resultant of the lens with which you view it. So I realized that across the world, there have been uh, very significant, uh, extremely negative views of what's been happening in India. And the fact is that it is a sad reality that a significant number of people have lost their lives. It is a truth that 26 million people have been affected by COVID. And the death rate is currently 1.12%. But uh, you know, from the time the slide was made, which was last week for our board meeting, we had to report to the board what we're doing. Uh, it's, it's moved actually from 24 million to 26 million, which is today's date. In relationship to the world, the world has reported 162 million. So uh, I will just be quickly showcasing what Apollo hospitals did in the context because I really want all of you and many of you have played a supportive role uh, in the Indian healthcare system. I want you to be reassured that despite the tremendous uh, impact of the numbers of the shortages of, of uh, oxygen, of medication, of manpower, the Indian healthcare system has stood up. Yes, there have been cases where patients were denied beds. Yes, there have been shortages of oxygen. However, as an overall system, our doctors and nurses across the country have done a heroic job. And uh, I, I hope that 
history will record this point and history will record the fact that if we had had more infrastructure on the ground, we could have done even more. Having said that, I will quickly move on uh, to really give, uh, I think the world is continuing to try and analyze what has happened differently. Uh, and, and clearly here we see that uh, the, the first wave, which you can see around September 17th in my first slide was like a small speed bump compared to the significant rise uh, in the second wave. And it is this scenario where a seven day average of 350,000 cases and above uh, was, was what really hit the country with, with an, you know, a daily high going over 400,000 cases, which is not an easy scenario. However, the cumulative figures from March 20th to May 20, 9, uh, 2021, uh, really record a death of over 266, uh, 100,000 cases. But the recovered cases uh, are, are really quite significant. And I continue to reiterate the fact that the death rate is 1.12%. Uh, just moving on is really this significant difference of what happened in wave one versus wave two. While in wave one, we saw an average daily new cases of under 100,000. This is the average uh, daily new cases. In wave two, we, we peaked uh, at 400,000 cases. And this is a 4x increase in what the same health system, which had had no augmentation. And like Dr. Srinath Reddy rightly observed, some of the things where we had over three months to put up uh, facilities, extra beds, isolation units, all those had been decelerated. Uh, our daily average deaths uh, were at about 1,100 in the first wave and moved to 4,000, over 4,000 in the second wave. So this is a 3.7x increase. Our tests, and that luckily the labs have ramped up and geared up, but uh, where the daily average was about uh, uh, 10 lakhs, we actually moved to about 17 lakhs uh, in the second wave. And the positivity rate, which is a significant indicator of the extent of uh, the spread in the community, where we had 8.6% in the first wave was over 22% in the second wave with some cities and clusters like Maharashtra and uh, Delhi, there were days when they had a 40% positivity rate. Uh, so it is in this scenario that the country has fought and the citizens have, have really gone through a significant turmoil. And it is in this scenario that Apollo hospitals tried to create what we called project coverage. Coverage means shield. Uh, we brought to bear every single capability or infrastructure that we had and tried to give an integrated approach for those who have uh, not heard of Apollo hospitals. We run over 70 hospitals, have uh, approximately 300 clinics, uh, lab facilities, telemedicine, training programs, uh, et cetera. We put together, the first scenario was really Apollo 24 seven, which is our app. The app had uh, a COVID uh, risk scoring. Uh, we've had over uh, 12 million downloads of that. We're currently you know, continuing to service over 9 million in terms of teleconsults. Our daily video consults is upward of 8,000 per day right now. The clinics opened up uh, the, the, uh, the fever clinics so that people could understand what was happening to their fever. Apollo Diagnostic ramped up its capability to do RT-PCR testing. Today, we're doing approximately 25,000 RT-PCR tests per day. The Apollo Home Care, uh, you know, really swung into action, especially for care for the elderly at home. We're currently handling over 4,500 patients, uh, primarily in a remote management and about 700 patients with staff at home. STAI was an interesting program that we created where over 4,000 4, hotel rooms were converted into isolation rooms, which were supervised by telemedicine. Telehealth also did various initiatives to monitor these kind of facilities. Uh, research and innovation, we partnered with CCMB, with others who were trying to try out new drugs, uh, to bring in new testing methodologies, to shortcut the RT-PCR RNA extraction, 
uh, formula and formulate new kits. This, this kit is actually with uh, ICMR for approval right now. So various initiatives at multiple levels to really respond. But of course, the most significant initiative is the hospital where we converted out of our 10,000 beds, over 4,200 beds were dedicated to the care of patients. Uh, of these, most of them were in the high end. Uh, we've purchased over the last three weeks, over 250, we, so we purchased new ventilators, over 350 new ventilators, because that was really the demand. Being a tertiary care hospital, that is what people look to us for. Um, so we continue to ramp up our EICU initiative. So here we sp help small nursing homes, some of them who have three or four uh, patients and try to help them with the right protocol. So uh, skilling, training, research, rehab, communication, all these became very important aspects of our overall care. While we continue to stay dedicated to keep our emergency rooms running, uh, so that we can, uh, you know, help the non-COVID patients. Uh, I, I also want to highlight one very important factor, uh, which was that, uh, you know, the overall response. Sometimes we kind of look at what, uh, you know, wh how things move. So whether it was the registrations which grew or the coverage uh, initiatives which grew. Uh, on the app, over 22 million people viewed and engaged with uh, the app because there were lots of preventive healthcare tips as well as um, you know, a very active chatbot to remove so many of the fallacies. Uh, we also had over a million customers who really went through purchasing their medicines because they did you know they were scared to come out we've delivered these medicines to their home uh, and over 120,000 covid positive patients have consulted on our free platform during the last 30 days so we give this teleconsult free of cost uh, so that people are taking the appropriate care and for those who cannot reach hospitals or find the right doctor this has been one of the most popular services which has been most appreciated uh, as was rightly mentioned by Dr. Srinath Reddy, uh, technology has been a very important part. So our uh, COVID updates at the telehealth, uh, we've seen a 40% surge in the doc on call or for doctors. And here, in addition to the 7,000 teleconsults, we're doing approximately 1,300 telephone calls for people who haven't downloaded the app or who are not familiar. Uh, we are answering the telephone in multiple languages. Uh, we're also looking at, um, you know, just an increase in the contact center uh, where people just want to understand what do we do? Where's the closest clinic? How do we get our tests done? And this has been an important part of really educating public. We've shared all these protocols with the government so that there is an ability for some, uh, some state governments to really set up their own call centers. And even as FIKI, uh, we help state governments set up call centers. I also want to share with you that in the uh, the isolated telemedicine facility uh, or the, the hotels, the usage of this device was a very important enabler so that people who were alone in their hotel room uh, were managed through an admission process. They had a uniform protocol for COVID management. This device was used for vital monitoring. There was virtual doctor consult. We also managed to get patient feedback and stay connected. And at a central level, the dashboard was really telling us what was happening in these hotel rooms. Uh, so I, I think this is, this is a, a model which can be shared and emulated uh, across. And we've shared this protocol, of course, with the government. And many other corporates are setting up their isolation centers, some of which we helped uh, help them create. So we're also managing uh, COVID management centers or isolation centers for other corporates using telehealth. Uh, I mentioned earlier the enhancement in the RT-PCR. We also managed to do drive-in centers when state governments gave us permission so that we were able to spare our technicians from going to people's homes because the biggest call was to come home and do the testing. And this was a great demand on resources and manpower. Um, 
also just looking at the uh, the overall uh, change in the home care, which I mentioned. So in the first wave, we managed about 10,000 cases in nine months. And in the second wave, we did about 10,000 patients at their home. And these are, you know, individuals who were really desperate. Uh, but we did that in a period of six weeks. So that scaling has really been a lesson. Uh, but overall, the, the home care team has uh, treated and, you know, brought uh, satisfaction to over 20,000 homes. And many of these are the, the parents of NRIs living across the world. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very happy to share this. Uh, just uh, the last few slides, I just want to say that our reach out has also been to the medical fraternity. And one of the important aspects is the Apollo Red Book where we shared the COVID care protocol. I think that in a world where information has really um, escalated at a tremendous pace. And every day, there were hundreds of new papers and new protocols. So we had a dedicated research team who was taking the latest of care protocols, analyzing if they were validated, and incorporating that protocol into our red book. And this red book was then shared uh, with other nursing homes. In fact, I had a, a very senior public health specialist send me a thank you note saying that he managed his parents at home using the Apollo uh, care protocol. And so that, you know, things like that felt very good. Uh, so we, we focused our attention on communities, whether it was in terms of information, treatment, testing, but also on the medical fraternity with CMEs and webcasts and on-site training uh, for various of them. Uh, we, you know, tried to create the ecosystem COVID ready and created some new protocols because typically a family briefing is done face to face. We had to upgrade our uh, electronic communication so that family patient briefing became uh, um, uh, chat enabled and video enabled because the family members could not even be at the hospital. So many things like this caused for innovation, speed of response, retraining of our own staff, while at the same time keeping their positive, and this is their mental positivity, not their COVID positive rates, but keeping them uh, you know, at a high degree of motivation. Uh, this is the COVID Red Book and the uh, care protocol, which is now into its 41st updation since the time we started. Uh, and it is documents like the handbook and the Red Book, which have helped us really deliver this medical excellence with a human touch. As we move into this phase now, uh, where vaccines are becoming more and more available, we hope to be among one of the largest COVID vaccinators while our doctors and nurses cannot move from treatment, we have engaged into the ecosystem a parallel uh, team, and we aim to vaccinate 20 million citizens by October 2021. Uh, it is uh, also of, of interest, I think, to many of you on what we've done on research and publications. Uh, so India has brought forth about 8,431 publications during this time. And I'm happy to say that Apollo was uh, able to contribute about 220 of them. So I thank and commend our doctors for finding the time and the will and the energy to share this knowledge on a continuing basis. Um, I end by saying that one of uh, the unique initiatives that came out during this time is a project called Project Angel. And I seek everybody's support and indulgence in this one, because while, uh, you know, the world has been so generous, uh, I heard of the 500 ventilators which came into India, which has probably supported the government health system. I know that the US has sent over 80 planes of all kinds of uh, medicines and uh, you know, ventilators and, and material, and everybody has been so generous. But I call to attention one segment of our workforce, which was our nurses. And I hope that even after the pandemic, we continue to be, understand that they are the angels working in the front line. Many of them getting get a starting salary of only 15 to 20,000 rupees. So this is like 200, $300 a month. Uh, I, I believe that we need to do something to enhance the learning and then enhance their role in the healthcare system through upskilling, 
through creating nurse practitioners, through en enabling super specialization of nurses, and also bringing them into the management cadre. So the ANGEL program uh, was started by Apollo, but today I'm happy to say that many others, including Microsoft, Google, all are becoming partners, uh, and I'm happy to share more information on that. Uh, I think we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go into the Apollo Knowledge Series. Pro Health, uh, which is to focus on the community preventing comorbidities and bringing their diabetes and their cardiac problems under control. So we focus on primary health care at a, at a level uh, which has been unprecedented in this country. Uh, and we aim to do over 700,000 individuals in a health check, but also in a handholding, condition management, proactive counseling to bring uh, the entire non-communicable diseases under uh, control. I want to end by saying that um, our chairman continues to, uh, to say that anything that we do is but a small speck, and we are blessed with the ability to be able to serve people, and that our most uh, powerful motivator is the words of Mother Teresa, who said, you know, God bless you and grant you eternal strength because you are in the service of mankind. And that is indeed the spirit with which uh, all our team members are working day in and day out. And I congratulate all of you for your tremendous efforts, for your support to India and to other parts of the world, for your commitment to create uh, a research and a pandemic center, which is a global model, and look forward to, to sharing and partnering with all of you in the days to come on lessons that we have learned so that we collectively build a healthier and a stronger world. Because uh, as long as anyone suffers, I think the whole world suffers. And it is with that credo that we look forward to working together and partnering. Thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, namaste and stay safe and stay well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sangeetha Reddy. It has been a pleasure hearing you, sharing your experience with us and also our efforts to be doing initiatives with Canada, with looking for potential opportunities. We have, we'll, we'll be very pleased working with you on this, on this initiative. Also, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy fully agree with you what you have said about the angels. We in Canada, during the COVID, we have fully come to realize whether it is old age home or private care, we find the services offered by the frontline workers. We from Canada India Foundation, uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, we were delivering in, with the, in the Canadian weather, the winter, we were taking food to the frontline workers. The little that we can do from the civil society. I fully appreciate we are engaging ourselves, helping our government agencies as contribution from civil society, be it nurses, be it, uh, be it uh, police, we All want to be able to offer our 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 little contribution to our frontline work. I fully subscribe, fully understand. You, you and you, your colleagues have been doing wonderful work all over the world in India. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. God bless. Thank, Thank you. you and Namaste. Namaskar. Namaskar. Namaskar.